Hello. Welcome back to Dr. S's random math layer. Dr. S has returned from his first teaching assignment. Today's video involves the Cauchy Riemann equations, which we just briefly brought up in the problem 5 video about Taylor series, in the form of problem 7. This topic is typically covered in a course in complex variable theory, or complex analysis, at the college senior or first year graduate level. The Cauchy Riemann equations are often used to determine whether a function of one complex variable is complex analytic, or holomorphic, on a domain of the complex plane where it is defined. Before solving problem 7, we shall give a short refresher on complex numbers, discuss the historical background of the mathematicians for whom these special equations were named, and provide some quick facts and review that we will need. Links to some important online resources will be provided toward the end of this video, and also in the information below the video. Here is the statement of problem 7. Use the cauchy riemann equations to determine whether the following functions are complex analytic, or holomorphic, on a domain D in the complex plane C, over which they are defined. In part A, we have f of z equal to z squared plus 2z. In part B, we have g of z equal to the complex conjugation function z bar. Finally, in part C we have h of z equal to z times e to the z, where e to the z is the complex exponential function. Now here is a refresher on complex numbers. A complex number z in the complex plane C, can be written as z equal to x plus i y, with x and y real numbers, since c and the Cartesian plane R2 are related by the given correspondence. We refer to z bar, which equals x minus i y, as the complex conjugate of z. We call x the real part of z, and y the imaginary part of z, and both are denoted as given. One can easily verify that the real part of z equals z plus z bar, all over 2, while the imaginary part of z equals z minus z bar, all over 2. I, I leave it to you as a simple exercise. The modulus of z, as denoted here, is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts of z. Observe that z times z bar equals the square of the modulus of z. Figure 1 shows a vector representation of a complex number z, with a blue horizontal component along the real x-axis denoted by x, and a red vertical component parallel to the imaginary i y-axis denoted by y. Note that the modulus of z can be viewed as the magnitude of this vector. Moreover, the triangle formed by the horizontal component, the vertical component, and the vector, with its magnitude, satisfies the Pythagorean theorem, with the components serving as the legs, and the vector serving as the hypotenuse of the right triangle. In fact, the vector representation of the complex conjugate of z, is simply this vector reflected over the x-axis. A complex number z can be expressed in polar form as well. A link to this will be provided toward the end of this video, and it can also be found in the video description. Now let's start by looking at the historical background of Cauchy. Augustine Louis Cauchy was born in the late 18th century in Paris, France. At the time, because of the French Revolution, he and his family fled to the town of Arcueil. Moving back to Paris after the Revolution, by 1807, Cauchy graduated from the École Polytechnique, where in 1815 he would be appointed assistant professor of analysis. Here are some of his mathematical contributions. In calculus, he developed the convergence properties of integrals and infinite series. In abstract algebra, he founded the study of permutation groups and symmetric functions. In geometry, he came up with his own generalization of Euler's formula for polyhedra. In real analysis, he invented Cauchy sequences and discovered their convergence properties. In complex analysis, he was a pioneer in residue theory, and many of his results are known in his name even to this day, such as the Cauchy integral formula and the Cauchy-Riemann equations. To learn more about him, 
go to the source link given below his picture. You can also find it in the video description. We shall discuss the historical background of Riemann next. Here is some historical background on Riemann, who is considered to be one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Bernard Riemann was born in the early 19th century in the Kingdom of Hanover, part of present-day Germany. From an early age, Riemann exhibited exceptional mathematical and computational skills. In 1846, he attended the University of Göttingen to pursue a degree in theology, but he took more interest in mathematics, studying under Gauss. In 1847, Riemann got approval from his father, a Lutheran pastor, to transfer to the University of Berlin to pursue his mathematical interests. This was where the mathematicians Jacobi, Dirichlet, Steiner, and Eisenstein were teaching around that time. By 1859, Riemann headed the mathematics department at the University of Göttingen. Here are just a few of his major contributions in mathematics. In geometry, he developed what would be known as Riemannian geometry and the Riemannian metric, and considered Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry in higher dimensions. In calculus, he invented the Riemann integral, the main topic of integral calculus studied today. In real analysis, he extended the Riemann integral to the more generalized riemann steele yes integral studied in measure theory. In complex analysis, he is known for the Riemann mapping theorem and the study of Riemann surfaces, along with connections to the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Also in number theory, he formulated the Riemann hypothesis in his exploration of the Riemann zeta function. If you're interested to know more about Riemann, go to the link under his picture, or click the link in the video description. Here are some quick facts and review that we will need to solve problem 7. Consider a complex function f of z, and a point z0, in a domain d in the complex plane, over which f is defined. We say that f of z is complex differentiable at z0, if and only if the following limit, given in 7.1, exists. We denote this limit as f prime at z0, that is, the complex derivative of f at z0. As f is complex differentiable at z0, it's complex differentiable at each point in the domain d. Recall from the problem 5 video that such a function is called holomorphic, or complex analytic. Now suppose we write the holomorphic function f of z as u of xy, plus i times v of xy, where f, its real part u, and its imaginary part v all have continuous first partial derivatives. From this, we shall derive the Cauchy-Riemann equations, and determine f prime of z explicitly in terms of the first partial derivatives of u and v, with respect to both x and y. Without loss of generality, assuming h is real, by definition we have the following for f prime of z in 7.2. Note that in the first equality, we are approaching the limit in the horizontal direction parallel to the real x-axis, in the complex plane, while in the second equality, we are approaching the limit in the vertical direction parallel to the imaginary iy axis, in the complex plane. We will now move to the next step of our quick facts and review for problem 7. Continuing from where we left off, from the first equality in 7.2, and the properties of limits, we have that f prime of z equals the partial derivative of u with respect to x, plus i times the partial derivative of v with respect to x. Similarly, from the second equality in 7.2, we have that f prime of z also equals negative i times the partial derivative of u with respect to y, plus the partial derivative of v with respect to y. I leave it to you to verify this. Equating real and imaginary parts, we get the Cauchy-Riemann equations, the partial derivative of u with respect to x equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y, and the partial derivative of u with respect to y equal to the negative partial derivative of v with respect to x, given in 7.3. Moreover, f prime of z is as given. So if f is holomorphic on the domain d, over which it is defined, 
then its real and imaginary parts U and V, satisfy the cauchy riemann equations. We shall now move to the final step in our quick facts and review for problem 7. We continue with the last set of quick facts and review for this problem. It turns out that conversely, assuming that f of z, written as u plus iv, is defined on a domain d in the complex plane c and u and v have continuous first partial derivatives with respect to x and y, if u and v satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations, then f of z is complex differentiable, and hence, holomorphic on d. Due to time constraints, we won't prove this, but the proof can be found in any standard textbook on complex analysis. In polar coordinates, using the substitution x equal to r times cosine theta, and y equal to r times sine theta, where theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi, and the chain rule from calculus, as given, the Cauchy-Riemann equations can also be expressed like this. The following are known as the wording or derivatives, in 7.4. With f equal to u plus iv, using the second equation in 7.4, the Cauchy-Riemann equations in 7.3 are equivalent to the partial derivative of f with respect to z bar, being equal to 0 in 7.5. We are now ready to solve this problem. Let's begin solving problem 7. For f of z in part a, we can express it in terms of x and y as given here, where u equals x squared minus y squared, plus 2x, and v equals 2xy, plus 2y. From the Cauchy-Riemann equations, it follows that the partial derivative of u with respect to x, and the partial derivative of v with respect to y, both equal 2x plus 2, while the partial derivative of u with respect to y, and the negative partial derivative of v with respect to x, both equal negative 2y. Therefore, since both sets of equations are satisfied, f of z is holomorphic on its domain, and furthermore, f prime of z is given as follows. Note that f prime of z is in fact 2z plus 2. This tells us that if the complex derivative of a complex function exists, then it can be computed the same way as with real variables in calculus. Moving ahead, for g of z in part b, by definition it equals x minus iy, where u equals x, and v equals negative y. From the Cauchy-Riemann equations, it follows that the partial derivative of u with respect to x equals 1. But this does not equal the partial derivative of v with respect to y, which is negative 1. On the other hand, the partial derivative of u with respect to y, and the negative partial derivative of v with respect to x, are both equal to zero. Both sets of equations are not satisfied, and thus, g of z is not holomorphic on its domain. Clearly, it follows that g prime of z does not exist, since from the limit definition of the complex derivative, computing the limits in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction in the complex plane, gives different results for this function. Finally, Observe that the partial derivative of g with respect to z bar equals 1, which is not 0, again implying that g of z is not holomorphic on its domain. Now we solve the last part of problem 7. For h of z in part c, we can express it in terms of x and y, as given, where u equals e to the x, times x cosine y minus y sine y, and v equals e to the x, times x sine y plus y cosine y. From the Cauchy-Riemann equations, the partial derivative of u with respect to x, and the partial derivative of v with respect to y, both equal e to the x, times 1 plus x, times cosine y, minus y sine y. Also the partial derivative of u with respect to y, and the negative partial derivative of v with respect to x, both equal negative e to the x, times y cosine y plus, 1 plus x times sine y. Consequently, since both sets of equations are satisfied, 
h of z is holomorphic on its domain. Moreover, h prime of z equals 1 plus z, times e to the z. As an exercise, I encourage you to verify this using the limit definitions of the complex derivative in 7.2. This concludes problem 7. Don't forget to subscribe, if you like this video. See you soon folks.